Okay, so I guess we will get started here. Um, so the good news is you've made it to this point in the week. Other than uh, Ryan's New York Time project, there is going to be no additional homework for this week. This week is all about catching up um, on, on everything, right? So this isn't just a review of last week. Today, we are going to just blast through everything, starting from concepts, going all the way back to day one. We're going to do a self-assessment. So the goal for today is to throw out a concept, do a quick example. I don't have any of this prep. It's meant to be like an on-the-fly, like, let's just touch on a couple things here, hopefully jog the memory, um, and then give it an assessment of where we're at. So um, I'm going to pull up the um, outline for today and share my screen. Uh, make sure I posted this week 11. Oh, that's a typo. I'm supposed to say week 11, day two outline. Okay. Uh, let's pop that open. And this is probably the most lightweight uh, outline you've seen. That is very much intentional, right? The goal here is to have a lot of questions and just do a review, figure out where we're at. So um, I'm going to pop open this self-assessment. Um, hopefully everyone has this link open uh, to get started, name and email. Uh, we're collecting email largely so that you can get a copy of this assessment um, after you uh, after you complete it, right? So um, hopefully that this is a good review for you because the goal is that after this, I can get all of this in and say, okay, uh, only one student is really struggling with this concept. Let me send them a couple additional resources or oh man, everyone is struggling with this. Let's spend some more time tomorrow going through that, doing a deeper dive, going through the exercises, recovering, reteaching, or whatever it may be. So uh, I'm going to go through step by step here um, and just start doing examples of these concepts. If you uh, normally don't ask questions, today is your chance to interrupt me and go, no, no, I need more on that. Please, please explain a little bit more. Um, but the idea here is that we're going to jog your memory um, so that you remember what those terms are or how we use them. And then you can give yourself, hopefully, a more accurate assessment. So um, these assessments are not going to impact your standing in the class. This is meant to be honest. This is not, uh, do not panic. If you feel like you're answering every one of these is like, uh, I don't really know this. That is okay. Um, hopefully, uh, we, we just have a, a chance to check in here. This is like the weekly feedback form on steroids, right? We are taking all of these concepts and just gauging where you're at in the class. So um, hopefully, I've bought everyone enough time to fill out their email and their name. Um, this is uh, going to be a fill it out as you go kind of thing. But don't just blow through all of the questions. Wait until I've covered that concept and then you'll be able to answer it and move on to the next section. Um, any questions before we dive in? Um, I will drop the link in um, both Slack and in Zoom so you guys have it. Uh, one is going there and one is going... Uh, into the live stream. Give me a quick thumbs up in Zoom if you've got the form open and you are in section two, which is HTML. So I kind of lied. This is a homework assignment. You do have to fill this out as we go in class, but um, you are pretty much seeing the extent of, of all the sections here, which is just giving yourself um, a score from like, what in God's name is he talking about? When did we ever cover this? All the way up to hold my beer max, I can, I can totally teach this. Uh, so whatever uh, gauge you're at is completely okay. Um, but this is, this is meant to be a, a memory jogger of a class. And then we can spend the rest of the week um, dissecting based off of the results of this. Okay, 
So let's dive in. First thing, HTML elements and attributes. So I'm going to pop open VS Code. You do not have to follow along with me at for, on any of the code today. Um, nothing it, uh, that we're coding out today is going to get turned in, but I will share these files with you um, at the, the end of class in case you want to go back and reference them. Um, that's, that's completely fine, but we're not building anything today. This is meant just to be um, kind of a, uh, a reminder of the concepts and how we use them. Um, with that said, I am going to quickly create a week 11 day two folder. And I'm going to create my index.html. Okay, so HTML elements and attributes. An HTML element is basically any tag that we use. So of course, the most common HTML um, element is going to be a div tag or div element. And in those uh, elements, we can put uh, content. Right, so I'm going to put my content in there. I'm going to hit go live. I'm going to pull this over so you can see it. OK, so uh, there are lots of HTML elements or tags. Div is the most common. We've also seen P tags. And we have seen uh, span tags. So we can put a tag in there and move the word in. And now we also have attributes that can go on each one of those elements, right? So one attribute that we can put on it is the style attribute, and we can add something like font weight bold. So basic HTML elements are going to be any tag that we use. And then any HTML um, attribute is going to be essentially the properties that we add on to that, that element. Um, there are also some self-closing uh, HTML elements like HR um, and, uh, and BR if we wanted to like add a line break in. But that is pretty much the extent of them, right? So we've got an, our HR showing up. We've got our span tag showing up in line. Uh, and we also have our break element wrapping it down to the next section. Any questions on HTML or elements or attributes before we move on to the next one? Any questions about syntax or general concepts or when we would use this? Nope. So some of these, I tried to break all of them down into basic sections here. If you are drooling and completely bored out of your mind, that is probably a good thing. Um, if you are, not, if you have questions, don't don't be afraid to shout them out or send them to Karen. And Karen is a pro at interrupting me and asking uh, asking questions as well. So feel free to send them Karen's way as well. Okay. Next concept is HTML nesting and indentation. Well, we've already done some nesting going on in here, right? We've already put a span tag inside of our P tag. The general thinking here is that HTML often requires uh, you to break up your content into several different pieces, right? So we might have a div for our nav bar. Um, so we could do a div uh, class equals nav. And then in our nav bar, we may want to have something that shows up on the left section. Uh, so we could do an ID of left and say, this is going to be my left section. And then we would have another div in here called our ID equals right section. I love Nemo. Love, 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 love Nemo. Okay, so from here, um, we could break this down even further, right? We may want to uh, find a different uh, piece of this and break this down into a further div, right? Um, so whenever we put a, an element inside of another element, we always want to go one indentation level deeper. The only exception to that is, is if it's an inline element, right? So this span tag didn't end up on its own line because we're just styling a little piece of it, right? But in general, whenever we are putting a div inside of a div, we're indenting one level uh, deeper. And the reason why that's important is so it's easy to say, hey, I know that this closing div tag is a closing div for this because it's all indented on the same level. 
I also know that this hello world is going to be right next to this nav because the indentation is following all the way down. Any questions on that before we move on? Okay, moving on to the next one. And hopefully as I'm hitting these, you're, you're going through the Google form and just doing a quick self-assessment of, I'm bored by this, I totally get it. I feel like there's nothing else to learn or I don't remember what he was talking about or somewhere in between. Okay, so next up, uh, CSS style tags, links, and inline, right? There are basically three ways that we can use our CSS or cascading style sheets. The first one um, is by going up into our head and adding uh, style. And anything between those style tags, you're telling the browser, hey, this is no longer HTML. This is some CSS that we're going to add in here, right? So if we wanted to, we could uh, use a CSS selector um, like our class nav. And in that nav, we could add a border to the bottom of it, uh, 2px uh, solid black. So when we come over here, we see that we've got our red border, or, or I'm sorry, our black border now showing up. That's the first place we can put our CSS. Second place we can put our CSS um, is using the link tag. So if I come over here, I create my style.css and I target something like my, um, let's say I'm gonna target my left nav. I can target my left nav and say, hey, anything on the left side is now going to be color red. So in order for my browser to know that this style sheet exists, in the head tag, I need to do my link. And our link has uh, two attributes to it, right? It's got our rel. We've got to tell it, hey, when you go load this in, know that it's a style sheet. And then also our href, which is going to point it at the style.css. So if we save that, come over here, we now have our left section showing up in red. Third place we can put our CSS is inline. And we've already done this with this style font weight bold, but let's just do another example of it. We can make this color blue. And we're using, of course, all the same CSS syntax. We're just happening to use it either embedded in our style tag or in our link tag or in a style tag where we're embedding that CSS directly. So I save that, I come over here. Now we've got our right section showing up in blue and we have covered the three ways we can use CSS. Okay, moving on to the next concept. You have a question, Christy? Um. Real, real quick, and the reason why I asked this because I was looking at this um, while you were talking. But um, so you see this third line meta. <clears throat> Can you go over that again? Meta name equals viewport content with device width. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't have this on the um, on the quiz, the self assessment, but that's okay. So first things first. Um, let's start all the way at the top. This doc type HTML is telling the browser, hey, this is the document type. Because back in the day, there were multiple versions of HTML that browsers would support. One of them was XHTML, um, and there were a couple other ones. So the doc type HTML is telling the browser, hey, this is modern day, straight up HTML. You don't need to parse this any differently. The lang en tag is telling the browser, hey, this entire document is written out in English. So if you're supporting multiple languages through a standard called I18LN, um, that is how you could build a web page out and have multiple languages and basically tell Google Translate or whoever else is translating the website, hey, all of this content is in English. Then we go into the head tag. Head tag is all the information the browser needs that it doesn't really ever show to the end user, but it's telling the browser how to process all of your HTML. The first one is using meta caraset UTF-8. That is basically the character encoding 
um, for basically saying what letters are you using on this page and how does the computer take those letters and convert it into binary. So UTF-8 is the most common modern standard. Um, by setting the carset to UTF-8, you're basically telling your browser, hey, I can use emojis and I can use some international language characters and um, I can use basically the modern way of converting um, text into binary. Next up, you're getting your uh, XUA compatible IE Edge. This uh, line is less important now that Internet Explorer is finally dying out. But basically what you're doing is you're telling, hey, if this page does get loaded in Internet Explorer, try and parse it through using the Edge browser. The Edge browser was like the last iteration of, of Internet Explorer um, before they went fully over to Edge. But basically what you're doing here is you're saying, hey, browser, please try and parse this in the most modern way if you happen to be using Internet Explorer. Um, so this is really just a legacy thing to try and tell um, the browser, hey, try, try and, and parse this using the most uh, modern technology. Now we come down into the meta viewport uh, content with equals device with initial scale equals 1.0. This is what is basically setting up your page to be mobile friendly. What you're doing is you're saying, hey, take the viewport basically the width of the, the page, right? The, the section of the site that you can see is called the viewport. And you're saying the width is going to start out as the device width. In other words, take whatever the width is of the device and make our viewport that size. That's super important for mobile because on desktop, we just assume, hey, it's gonna be, the viewport's gonna be whatever the size of the window is. But basically, we're giving CSS a leg up here, and we're saying give this the width of the viewport the device width information. In other words, take whatever, however many pixels the device is, and set that to our, our uh, default starting width. And then also set our initial scale to 1.0. What that's saying is make it so that we don't have to pinch in to zoom to see any of the content, or we don't have to pinch out to see any of that as well. So you could actually play with this and set this equal to like 5.0. And if you loaded this page on a mobile uh, device, you would actually have to zoom out in order to see the entire page. So what this is, the, the overall summary of this meta viewport is basically saying, hey, set us up for mobile responsiveness. Set us up so that this page loads correctly on a mobile page, on a mobile browser. The title tag is just setting whatever our tab is up at the top. So mine says document right now. And if I just call this code example, um, that's going to change in the browser. Every browser will show up the, the title a little differently. Um, and then, of course, we can add additional things into our head, like style tags or links to other style sheets. And then the body is, of course, anything that's going to show up to the end user. Any questions on that? Um, I have a quick question. What was the name of that one? Just because I want to make sure I'm checking it off right. Um, that one was not on the on the quiz, so don't worry oh, about okay. that one. All right. I will. I'm gonna try and add it live. See what happens. Um, oh, maybe I'm not. Okay, I added one called HTML page structure um, at the top of the HTML and CSS section. But if it did not show up for you, that's fine. I did not make it a required field. Um, if you refresh the page, it should auto save your responses and show that one. Um, but it's it's no big deal um, if you don't have it answered. Okay, 
So we have covered CSS style tags, links, and inline. And now we are on to CSS selectors, properties, and values, right? So this may be one of those concepts that you were using without knowing the name of what you were using. Um, the CSS selector is basically selecting what, what styling should be applied to what, right? right? The selector is saying, what are we selecting here to style? So selectors are um, have a, a special syntax with them. We know the period matches the class. We know a pound sign matches the ID. We can even do a selector that is going to target, say, all span tags and make the span tags uh, aqua. So a selector is can be as complex as you want. You could say, hey, only target um, span tags that are directly inside of a P tag. But the general selector is saying, hey, we're going to apply a bunch of styling inside these curly braces right here. What do you want to style? And that's how we're going to select what to apply those styles to. Then the other two parts are properties and values. The property is whatever comes before the colon. That's saying what we're where what property we're styling, and then the value of that property is what we're what we're applying to it. So there are a bunch of different properties that apply to CSS. Um, at some point, I have linked to the um, all the CSS properties. But if you are curious, um, you can just go on Google and do a search for CSS properties and open up the CSS reference, and you will see a very long list of all the properties that you can apply um, in your CSS. Uh, and then we can take something like, uh, let's say, border top and practice using that. So in our um, nav, we could add a border top. This is our selector. This border top is our property. And then the value of it uh, is going to be whatever comes after the colon. So 2px, let's say dashed and blue. Now, this, this level of understanding, I am not expecting you to have every property memorized because I know maybe a tenth of them off the top of my head. And I do not expect you to have all the values memorized either, right? So all I'm expecting here is that you know that, hey, I can go in here and I can do a search for CSS border and pop that open and see all the different values that are allowed here and see how they are used and, and um, that you can take this documentation and you can apply it, right? So um, not expecting this level of mastery to say, hey, I've got them all memorized. Just saying, hey, I know what a selector is, I know what a property is, and I know what a value is. I may not know all the properties or I may not know all the values, but I can, if, if someone showed me some CSS and said point to the property, I would be able to identify that this is a property that we're using. Any questions on that? Okay, moving on to the bootstrap grid. The grid is a system for laying out, right? We, are, we use bootstrap grid to be able to lay things out in rows and columns. So in order to use our uh, bootstrap grid, we've got to pull in bootstrap. Now, first things first, bootstrap is a CSS framework, right? At the end of the day, all CSS is, is a uh, very large CSS file that Bootstrap provides to us that allows us to use classes that they have provided. So if we go in um, to Bootstrap, we can grab our CSS style sheet link and go back to our code. And in our code, we can paste that in. And now we've got access to any uh, class Bootstrap has defined for us. So what we can do is if we want two things side by side, we can use a div class here. And before we can use any columns, columns always have to go in rows. And from that row, we could say div 
class equals call and move our div into that column. And then we can use another div class equals call and move that right section into our column. And now when we see our left section and our right section are now next to each other. Although, That didn't do what I thought it was going to do. Um, what did you think it was going to do? They should have been equally spaced. So right section should have been on this half of the okay. screen. I just wanted to make sure that I we were on the same page, because that's what I was thinking, was that it would be. Me too. What are my options here? I don't think I learned this at all. Maybe refresh. I don't know. Um, you give all the divs a border just to just to see where they all are sitting on the page. Let's see if I take out color. Definitely shouldn't impact it. Um. Well, I know my bootstrap is loading because the font has changed. Do I need to put everything in a container? Oh, maybe. No, I didn't fix it. Div class row, call six. Very confused. I really hope they did not change something major in Bootstrap. Would the nav have anything to do with it at all? Maybe they have something on the nav. I don't see why it would, because if that's oh, your nav bar. Yeah, good call. Really? Brian. His nav might be something specific. In might have been Bootstrap. styled like a certain width or something. That is know. exactly what it is. So Bootstrap has a um a nav bar and that nav bar you can see is using the class of nav so mm. we accidentally oh. had stepped on something in bootstrap by applying one of their classes that we didn't mean to very good very good catch larry okay rewinding it back to the grid told you all of this was live so our grid is always based off of a 12 column system right so if we want uh, something to take up one third of our page and the other thing to take up two thirds of our page, we're able to adjust that using our columns here. So we're able to say call four and call eight. And now you'll see our left section is a little bit smaller and our right section is a lot bigger. Did I do that math wrong? That would be one quarter and three quarters. Um, but we can adjust our column sizes here. Um, so if we wanted to, we're able to use our grid system. And of course, we can always use multiple rows. Uh, so we could flip that and say, this is going to be an eight, and this is going to be a four. And now our right section is taking up a quarter of the space, but only on the right side of the screen. The left section is taking up the other 75% of the screen. It's a third, thirds max, one third and two thirds. Yeah, that. Um, four divided by 12 is thirds. Yeah, thank you. Um, if we wanted to go into, um, if we wanted to go into thirds, we would be able to adjust that based off of however large our column is. And then if we don't specify a size, it will just take up whatever the remaining space is. So uh, you'll notice nothing changed here because we have a uh, dash four defined. Now, the other thing uh, using the bootstrap grid is we can also target multiple screen sizes, right? We can say, hey, on super tiny screens, we want this to take 12. We want this to take the whole column width up. But if we want this to be side by side on larger screens, we're able to do that as well. So we're able to say something like, hey, on extra small screens, be a 12, otherwise be a four. And we can say the same thing down here. I'm just going to comment that out. 
now our code is side by side because we're not on an extra small screen. But as soon as we pull it down to that screen size, to a small screen size, and define that we want uh, medium and larger to be here, now it wraps. Right, so we're able to pull that out. And as soon as we hit a medium screen size, it goes back to side by side. But as soon as we are below that screen size, you notice these two sections end up taking up the full space. And uh, Doug made a suggestion earlier that we probably should have done to, in order to see how big those columns are, we can target any row and any div inside of the row, we can add a border of 2px solid green. And that's going to help us see, hey, these two columns are 12 width. They're taking up the whole space. But when we expand them out, they'll go side by side. And this is going to take up 4 out of the 12. And this is going to take the 8 out of the 12. Any other questions there? Okay, moving on to bootstrap components. Um, bootstrap components are basically saying, hey, the grid is a great uh, utility. It's great for laying things out, but bootstrap has more built for us that we can kind of use as a template. So uh, for example, we can go into the buttons and bootstrap has these nicely styled buttons for us that have nice little rollover effects. And the way we can use them is the same way we use the grid system, right? We just need to make sure that whatever class we are using um, matches in our HTML. So if I like this warning button, I'm able to take this button and copy that whole bit of code, come back in here, and let's say I want to add it in my left section, and now I can say my button text in here, and now I get a nicely styled button. Now, if I come in here and remove that class, I'm able to see whatever the default styling is of the button, right? So that is that class that Bootstrap has defined for us right here is how we are hooking our custom HTML, whatever we're building into the Bootstrap CSS framework so we can use any of that styling. And of course, there is more than just uh, buttons. We could go through and get something uh, more like a, uh, let's grab the card. And this card has some uh, a nice rounded borders. It's got a title. It's got buttons. Um, I'm able to just copy this whole thing and paste it into my own code. And just like that, other than the broken image, I'll get the uh, nicely styled card with the rounded borders, a button already defined, some spacing already defined between my card title and stuff like that. So I would highly encourage you to use Bootstrap for your capstone, um, although it is not a requirement. Okay. Moving on to the last real question, and then we sum it all up and move on. So the last step is divvying out a mock-up, right? So we've done this a bunch of different ways, but if I just go to a random website, here is Syracuse.com. And if I'm thinking about this is how can I build this site myself? Oftentimes it's easier to break this up into sections visually so that we can see where our divs are going to be before we roll into the actual coding out of everything. So I'm just going to take a quick uh, screenshot of this page. And then I am going to open that screenshot and use my tools in preview to, to start breaking this down into components. So the first obvious part that I see is, hey, I've got a nav bar up here. So I'm going to insert a rectangle and just draw that across and make my line something a little bit more visible. OK, now in that nav bar, there are more divs that I can see broken out here. 
So I'm going to add another rectangle shape. I'm going to change the color and I'm going to move that. Ooh, it's probably not the best option. Let's go for that darker purple. And I'm able to see, hey, this is going to be one section of my nav bar because it's going to be everything on the left. Then we've got another div that's going in here and that's going to be everything in the center of the nav bar. And then finally, we've got one more section over here on the right. And we know, hey, subscribe is going to be another button, right? And sign in is going to be another button. But what we're trying to do here is break our site down into each individual div. So we can come down here and say, hey, there's a secondary nav bar. That's going to get its own div. OK, now we keep going. Now this next section of the site is one giant container. But in that giant container, we're able to break down and say, hey, we've got one column going on here. We've got another column going on in here. And we've got one final column going on over here. Now, of course, we would need to go in and, and further break those down, right? And say, OK, well, this latest section, this top part is going to have its own div because it's got its own styling. And then we're going to go further down and say, hey, each one of these is going to have their own div. But we need to go even further because we've got some things on the left and some things on the right as well. So we're going to do one final breakdown of this. And we're going to say, hey, the we're going to have two separate areas for those elements in there. So starting to go through a page when, whenever you're provided a mock-up or a wireframe and being able to identify, hey, I need to break this down into separate sections. Now I'm gonna get lost in my divs unless I have planned out what elements are going in what elements. So the goal of this exercise is to be able to identify a section of the page and say, hey, this headline is going to be its own section, its own div or its own H1 or whatever it is inside of this parent, which is going to be a row inside of this parent, which is going to be a big column, which is in itself in another row because we've got three different columns showing up there and that we always have a row between our columns when we use them. So, that is divving out a mock-up, kind of identifying where we need separate divs or where we need the column system and being able to break it down into component parts in order to plan and outline our section before we dive into the code. Okay, I'm gonna take a two minute break. Overall summary, HTML and CSS is how you're feeling about HTML, CSS in general. Um, and then there are two open comments for, hey, what, where are we at with your portfolio? Um, are you feeling good? Are you feeling like you can add things to it? Are you feeling like you need help with it? Um, and then any uh, general additional comments, uh, if you don't have any, that one is one of the only questions that's uh, not required on the form. Uh, so take a minute. Uh, share your thoughts of where we're at there, and then we will move on um, to the DevOps section. I generally feel pretty confident about HTML and CSS. Is the more we we do it, it feels better and better. I, I've even watched um, videos where I saw this nav bar where it was um, animated and going around and I was trying to work on it because it's like, I thought it was cool. So yeah, generally HTML and CSS is, is a strong suit. Awesome. And I think that it's very easy to go, nah, I don't know. I feel like at the end of week four, I didn't really get HTML. And now going back through it, when you've got the list and you see me go through all of it, you're like, yeah, I'm bored out of my mind right now because I know all of this stuff, right? 
Um, and that's okay. It's, it's um, very easy to feel like it's an endless thing that you need to learn. But that was the point of this, the, of me putting together this self-assessment is saying, here are the HTML concepts or the CSS concepts you need to know. If you feel like you've been introduced to them and you can use them fairly well, that's the, the goal we're shooting for, right? Mastery is great, but we're not, our, our goal for your threshold of understanding is not mastery on any of these concepts because it's a boot camp, right? The goal here is that you're, you're getting it, you're feeling familiar with it. You feel like if you couldn't get it, you could probably go out and know what to Google or read the documentation and have it click there. And if you are at that level, that is the, this is pretty familiar. I mostly get it and we're, we're doing well. Okay, we are moving on to DevOps. Unless anyone needs another minute to get their thoughts down on section two, which is all about HTML and CSS. Is there anything, any concepts that uh, I did not cover that you would like me to do a quick, uh, a quick example on for HTML, CSS? Max? Yep. Uh, my only thing is, I, I'm so sorry, I came in um, a little late. So I came in right when you were saying these are three different ways that you can do CSS. Yep. I understand having your CSS page. I understand the .nav and things right inside of the HTML page. What was the other one that I missed? Yep. Let me close and save. Um, number one is using the style tag directly in your index.html. Number two is linking out to your style sheet and then doing the styling in its own separate file. And mm -hmm. the third one is inline styling, uh, which is adding the style attribute to any HTML element and then uh, applying your CSS directly in line. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, ready to move on to DevOps? So I'm realizing I may be bad and may be an unprepared teacher because I don't know if I have, I don't have GitHub desktop. So we are going to very quickly download GitHub desktop. I'm probably going to have to auth into GitHub in order to show how all of this works. Okay. Um, get up this top. Me one second, sorry. Okay. Uh, so I am going to go to Finder and I'm going to quickly install GitHub Desktop. And I want to just make sure that I've got the version with ARM64 because that's the Apple Silicon version. Uh, meaning that that's the latest, um, the latest processors Apple has produced. So we're going to take GitHub desktop and drag it into our applications folder. We should never, ever, ever run an application from our downloads folder because it makes the, the application do quirky things. So from applications, I'm going to pop open GitHub desktop. I'm going to open it. I'm going to sign into github.com which is going to launch this page in the browser. I'm going to enter my username and my password and hit sign in. You should always use two-factor authentication on any account that you create because it's additional security. If your password ever gets stolen, your account is still protected by one layer of um, security because they don't have your phone or wherever else you're getting your two-factor code. Um, so I'm going to use my GitHub account name. Okay. 
here is all of the repositories that I have access to, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, create a new repository on your hard drive. And I'm going to say, uh, this is the CIC review day repository. And the path that I'm going to choose is going to be in my desktop, my code week 11. And I'm going to call this my Git repo and hit open. And then I'm going to go ahead and create the repository. Okay, so that is the equivalent of uh, initializing our repository, or if we were using the terminal, git init. Okay, from there, we have to take our code and make sure it's inside the repository. So I'm gonna go to Finder, I'm gonna go to my desktop, to my my code, to my week 11 and take day two and move it inside my Git repo. Now, when I come back to my VS code, excuse me, there are local changes. Do I have to put it in there? Ah, okay. I wasn't fully in my repo. Sorry. Now that I'm in my repository, Git is a system for tracking all of our code changes, right? Um, this is the way that when, when code breaks, we're able to go through commit by commit, find what broke it, and be able to fix it down the road, in addition to allowing for team collaboration. So there are three steps to getting our code up to the server, right? First, we need to stage them. And staging them is saying, hey, these are the two files that I want to commit. I'm committing the code that I changed into the repository. So to stage them, all we do is we check them off. Checking off your staged files is telling it what files you would like to actually commit in. Then we go through and we add in our commit message or our summary message. So for this one, I'm going to say initial file creation. That is our commit message. And then we need to commit. Now, when we commit this, it is adding it into the repository, but only locally. This has not been pushed up to GitHub. This has not been synced to GitHub. We're doing all of these changes locally. So what we do is we hit commit to main, and now that is in our repository. And we know that because if we go to history, we can see the initial file creation here and the changes in that commit. Now, in order to um, push that up to GitHub, we're going to say publish repository to GitHub. Now we have to set up the repository, right? Because this doesn't, this only exists on my local computer. So I'm going to leave it as CIC review day. I'm going to say keep this code private because I don't want uh, people to be able to see it. And then other than me, and I'm going to hit publish. And GitHub is going to automatically create that repository for me and say that's good to go. Now, when I come back, I can make a change to this. Go back to my GitHub desktop. And now, oh, I'm not in the right one. Hold on. To make sure the folder that I have open is the one inside the repository because I moved some stuff around. Okay, so I'm gonna say left section and then another change. Now in my GitHub desktop, I'm gonna see this day two index.html. This is what's called a diff, right? It's showing me what is different between my original file and what I've added in. Obviously anything in red is what I took out and anything in green is what I've added in. So always three steps to committing and pushing your code. First, we've got to tell it what we're trying to commit. By default, we've got this day two index.html. Because it is checked, that is the equivalent of staging the file or adding the file to what we want to commit. Now we come down and we've got to give it a commit message. We're going to say added more text. Now, when we commit it, again, this is only going to commit locally. This is tracking our changes. So now we have committed that in. Now, finally, we have to push that up to the server. So I'm going to intentionally forget to push here for a minute. 
And I'm going to go to github.com. No, I'm not. Github.com. Okay, in my GitHub, I can see if I do a search for uh, what do they call the CIC review day? CIC review day. Here is the um, repository I created. And it just has the initial commit and the initial file creation. So if I pop open day two and look at my index.html, I still only have left section, even though my file has left section and then another change. And the reason uh, behind that is, again, because there's always two copies of our repository, right? There's the local repository that I have on my computer. And then there's the remote repository. And the way we keep those two in sync is by either pushing our local repository up to GitHub or by pulling the repository at github.com down into my local Git repository. So if I hit push here, it's going to go ahead and push everything up. And now when I go back to GitHub and refresh, refresh this page, we see and then another change. So uh, basic Git uh, commands that we want to uh, make sure we're understanding in the DevOps section, um, add or stage, commit, push, pull, and maybe fetch if that was covered. If not, no big deal. So basic Git operations, add, uh, commit, push, and pull. If you've got those under your hand, uh, under your control, oh, and and init as well, right? Can we set up a repository uh, either using the terminal or using um, GitHub Desktop or by going to GitHub.com? Do we understand those flows? Are we good there? Any questions on that? Um, not so much for the terminal, but everything else, yes. I have a question too. Yep. But yeah, I don't think you've gotten there yet, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so my question is about like when we're we not when we get to the like like can you go back to on the GitHub desktop and go back to where it says let's get started like in the beginning before you get get to this? I can try. Oh. Um, ah! I don't know if I can get back to the getting started? Um, <laughs> well, mine says, I have, um, it says let's get started, but I have all my repositories, but I wasn't sure what to do next. So would I clone it next? Would I, what would I do? Like, so it, it depends. Yeah. You have to ask yourself what you're trying to do, not looking at all the options that it's giving you. So if you are trying to, open an existing repository that you have up at github uh, at github.com and you want it on your local computer you're going to clone the repository onto your local computer so you can work with it however if you're trying to set up a new repository basically a new section of of your code or a new project you would want to create a new repository okay Thanks. Sorry, I don't know how to get back to the getting started. Oh, maybe go to summary? Nope. I don't know how to get back to that screen. But yeah, th that screen is basically saying, hey, what do you want to do, right? Do you want to open an existing repository? Do you have something on your computer already and you want to you wanna commit and make changes to that? Or, hey, do you want to start a new repository? Or, hey, do you want to clone an existing repository that's up at GitHub and pull it down onto my computer? Yeah, that's what I was trying to do because I think I made it on GitHub. So that's why it's like a little bit confusing to use GitHub desktop. So I'm sure so, so if you already have it up at GitHub, what you would want to do is clone that existing repository into a, a folder on your computer, then you would want to move any of your code that's somewhere on your computer into that folder that has the repository set up in it. 
And then you would be able to stage, commit, and push those changes up to GitHub. Right. So I was trying to clone it, and it says, like, this folder contains files. Oh. Git can only clone to empty folders. So you have to make a new oh. folder that oh. is empty in order to clone oh. into that. Even though I already have a, a folder for that specific yeah. one? Right, no well, well, if you have a folder for it, the folder has to also be empty. Well, should I erase the code I already put in it or like move it over somewhere and then use that empty folder then put it back? You, you have to make an empty folder, oh. clone into that, then move your code from wherever it currently is on your computer into that blank folder that you had just cloned, and then you would be able to make your changes. Okay. That is basic Git and GitHub operations, creating a new repository, adding files, committing, uh, pushing, and pooling. OK, buying a domain and setting up DNS. This is one that uh, I'm not going to demonstrate. Um, but basically, here, we want to understand that when we buy a domain, we're buying a domain from a registrar. Um, that registrar is uh, Google or Namecheap or GoDaddy or whatever service you bought your domain from. Um, DNS is the domain name system. That is what is tying your domain to wherever your web hosting is, um, your web or email hosting, right? So all kinds of different DNS records. Um, an A record is um, a record that is going to point your domain at a specific IP address. We have C name records, which is the same thing as an A record, but instead of pointing to an IP address, it's going to point uh, to another domain name. It's kind of like an alias, um, not quite, but, but similar. Um, then we also have MX records, which stands for mail exchanger. The MX records are what is tying your email to, I'm sorry, is tying your new domain to an email. Um, and then we have TXT records, basically short bits of text that we can set up, uh, whether it's on a subdomain or a regular domain, and we can tie that in to, um, we, can, we can use that as proof of verification or other things going on there. So um, making sure that you're comfortable, one, buying your domain, two, understanding that DNS is the linkage between uh, your domain registrar and wherever your hosting is. Sometimes those are the same, sometimes they're different. Um, being comfortable in DNS and understanding, hey, what an A record, a C name, and an MX record is, and a TXT record, uh, comfortable uh, configuring those, knowing that DNS propagation can take um, 24 to 48 hours, although normally it's much faster than that, and understanding the basic flow of the internet here of someone types in my domain name, it goes to my DNS records, Based off of the DNS records, it's going to return an IP address or some other information. My computer is then going to use that IP address and get information from the server. Good on all of that. Any questions there? Any terms that I used that Nathan most certainly did not? Um, so this is a pretty short section. Uh, give me an overall gauge of where you're at in basic DevOps, uh, deploying your site, making sure that you know, you're comfortable with DNS, making sure that you have a basic Git flow and understanding, uh, making sure that you understand what DevOps is and understanding that operations behind a developer and make, setting up the servers and making things deployable and working in the terminal and managing Git repositories and all of that stuff, that all falls under uh, DevOps. So I'm going to give everyone a moment to fill that out. And then we're going to head into everyone's second favorite section, JavaScript. Blah. Oh, don't worry. We're getting to APIs next. APIs is so bad. It's all right. We're gonna we're gonna touch on. We're gonna go through a couple slides. It's probably the section I am most prepared for.
Okay, good to move on. Everyone, I hope, is writing me super detailed notes. I'm going to read them like love letters tonight and cry myself to sleep of how much else we have to cover tonight. That's or this week, but that's okay. This is not going to be like your homework assignment. This is going to be, uh, you're going to have feedback on this before tomorrow's class, or it's going to be built into tomorrow's class. Okay, moving on to JavaScript. Um, so uh, whenever we are working with our JavaScript, I'm going to just call it script.js, um, we can do a lot of different things in our JavaScript, right? We can say um, const num1 equals 2 and const num2 equals 3. And we can say, hey, take num1 and add it to num2. Now, this is perfectly fine JavaScript. And we know this is perfectly fine JavaScript because if I pop this open, I can go to Node and say, hey, go run my script.js. And it goes, great, no problem, did it. But we have no way of knowing it did it or what it did because we didn't output our, our number anywhere. We told it to add these two numbers together and it did it, but there was no output. There was no saying, hey, please show those two numbers added together. So the way we solve for that is by saying, hey, add in a console log num1 and uh, num2. Console log is a built-in function to JavaScript. We know it's a function because it has parentheses after it. And what console is doing is it's piping our output when we use node into the terminal that we execute the script in. So because we say node script.js, we're getting the output here. Now, of course, there is not another console. When we run our script through terminal, we get that output in the terminal as well, right? Then we see the console output in the terminal. But we can also see the output in the console in the browser. So if I come down to the bottom of my uh, file and say, hey, the script that I want to use is script.js, when I go live here, this all looks like what I had before, but when I go into inspect and go into the console, we see the number five coming out. So I'm kind of smushing these two together. One is seeing JavaScript output. One, we can see it in the console. Two, if we are running our JavaScript through Node, we can also see the output of the console in the terminal. But there are two different places we can run our JavaScript. In this example, when I said node script.js, we're running it in Node. We're not telling our browser to execute this script. We're just saying, hey, Node, this server, go server, go spin up, go run my JavaScript from top to bottom, output whatever it tells it to do, and then you're done running. That's the first place we can run our JavaScript. However, the place that is more common to run our JavaScript is in the browser itself. And the browser is outputting our console.logs into the console. Now, the console is meant to be a development tool. Um, regular end users are not really supposed to be going in there. Console.log is, is purely for debugging and understanding what the output is of our JavaScript that is running. So two places to run our code. Uh, the way we run it in uh, Node is by using the terminal. Of course, we have to have Node installed. But if we have Node installed, we can run script.js. That's going to run our code. The other way we can run our code, the more common place to run our JavaScript is in the browser. And the way we can get it to run it is either by putting it in index.html or just like our style tags, we can actually do it in log, in line, uh, and log something out in between our script tags. And so we see hi coming out from there. Any questions on seeing JavaScript output in the console or on Node.js versus the browser? Got a two for one there. Have we had any light bulb moments throughout this whole thing? Christy, what was your light bulb moment? Some of um, when you went back over some of the CSS 
and bootstrap stuff because of course when we see you doing it 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 makes perfect sense but when you're all alone because I was trying to do that button yesterday after we talked to you and it took my tic-tac-toe and it was nine lines going across I don't know what I did so I just took everything off so see and I I saw the warning because it was yellow and I wanted to use it and I did it because at that point everything was going straight across so I backed all the way out of it so I'll um play around with it some more but I just think that um it's kind of hard when you're playing around with it and you're you're alone um because if you're not doing something right you don't know what you're not doing right if it works out for you perfect but if it doesn't it's like you kind of um are lost so just seeing that again and the fact that I was going to try warning so that was help. that was kind of like a light bulb moment for me awesome Larry you said yes in the chat what was a, a light bulb moment for you um with the bootstrapping noticing knowing that it was supposed to split the the um the width between them two evenly and then being able to recognize oh well there's a nav class and there's a nav class that we put in and that bootstrap has a nav class as well so being mindful of the classes and what they're tied to mm -hmm. absolutely yeah kind of like what chrissy was saying yesterday when we went over to tic-tac-toe i was able to revise it but then i was trying to just see each time what empty squares there were and print them out, but I, it would only print out like once. So it was, it was that part was pretty frustrating, even though it works. Uh, not being able to do that was frustrating. All right. Awesome. Anyone else care to share? Okie doke. We're going to keep going. So, uh, most common data types in JavaScript. This is really where. Um, this is about JavaScript syntax, right? Because the data types are where we, we trip over the syntax the most, right? So we've already used um, a number data type. The other part of the data type uh, is we could say uh, a string. And strings are always going to be in single quotes, double quotes, or that sneaky template literal that we've used. Um, so a string data type is just some words, right? So if I, I say, hello world, now what the, this string is telling the computer is don't actually try and run the words, hello world. They, they don't make sense to you. We literally just want these letters to show up. What you're doing is if I say const um, var one equals num one, and I do const var two equals num one in quotes, because this is not in quotes, the computer is trying to find a variable and it's going to know that it's two. But if we put it in quotes, it now knows, oh, I'm not trying to actually run or find num1. I am just, I just am outputting that. So if we change our console.log here to output var1, and then we do another console log here to our output var2, we're going to get the number two printing out first because we did not put it in quotes. So it is literally going up to the num1 here saying, oh, num1 equals two. So now I'm going to put two here and that's what var1 is going to equal. But when I put num1 in quotes, it now knows, oh, I literally want the words num1 to be stored in my var2. And so I'm gonna output the word num1. So we've got number data types, We've got string data types. We've got arrays. Um, so I can say uh, animals. And the arrays are always going to use our bracket. And then our brackets can have uh, lots of data types in them, like strings, numbers, uh, even Booleans, um, or their own objects. Get to objects in a second. So arrays are just lists of data. Arrays are always zero indexed. So if I want to get out the first item in this array, I'm going to go to uh, the array index zero. So if I wanted to console log out my animals and get my first animal, I would use 
uh, my square brackets again and say index zero. And now I get my cat. Or if I wanted to, I could go in and get the third uh, index out of here. And I'm going to get false coming out because zero, one, two, three, false is the third item in the list. And then finally, we have our objects. Um, so objects are always going to get our curly braces. Curly braces are, uh, of course, not only used for objects. They're also used for defining our blocks of code. Um, but uh, to get started, uh, an object always has a key and a value pair, right? So we're going to say uh, the make of the car is Toyota. And the model of the car is going to be Corolla. And if we wanted to get that data out, we could console log out the whole object, which is going to give us the details. Or we can use two different syntaxes to get in there. We can either say car details dot make, and that's going to give us Toyota. Or we can say, use our square brackets and quotes and add in our make there. And that also gets us the Toyota out. Now, if we wanted to have a dynamic key, we could do that, but we couldn't use our dot syntax. We would have to use our square bracket syntax. So if I wanted to, I could say const key to get out equals model. Now model, I want to be an actual string but when I take key to get out, if I put it in here with the quotes, it's going to say undefined. There is no key to get out out of my car details. But if I take those quotes out, now it knows, hey, I'm not actually looking for the word key to get out in my object. I want key to get out to be whatever the string is. Oh, you would like to get the model out. So when we run that, we get Corolla out. And yes, I'm aware I probably spelled Corolla wrong. I don't know why I picked out that model. Hmm. So uh, data types, we've got strings, we've got numbers, we've got uh, null, which is basically saying there is nothing set to it uh, or undefined. Objects, which are always going to be our key value pairs and arrays, which are always going to be lists. Um, object keys always have to be a string. There is nothing else. We can't use a number here. We can't use a Boolean here. It has to be a string. However, object values and, and um, array values can be any data type. They can be numbers. They can be strings. They can be objects. And oftentimes, we will have objects in objects, or we will have objects in arrays. So you can nest any level deep. But again, it's all about pulling apart those layers of the onion and getting another layer uh, further down in our data. OK. Very, very helpful. I hope I don't need to go anything more into variables. Um, other than, I, I lied, I am going to go a little bit more into variables. There are three ways of declaring a variable. We have seen const up here. Const stands for constant. That means that value is not going to change. So if I take num1 and I set it equal to a new number and then console log out my num1 and run my code, I'm going to get an error that says assignment to a constant variable. What this code is trying to say is here's the five. And this equal is assigning the five into number one. But it's going to yell at me, and it's going to say number one was a constant. You're not allowed to change a constant. So my code literally gives up on running. I never get my console log out because it threw an error right on this line. Larry, go ahead. I know we can't reassign a value, but like for the arrays, how we can modify the array though, right? Correct. Because yeah. you're using methods on the array, if you tried to change the array entirely, uh, it would not let you do that. So if I have my const animals, 
if I want to say, hey, my animals are now going to be just dog, and I console log that out, it's going to yell at me and it's going to say assignment to a constant variable on my dog line. However, if I need to modify something inside of that array, like I want to animals.pop, because we're modifying the data inside the array and not overriding the whole array, it will let me do that even though it is a constant. So now you'll see my key value is missing from this because uh, the pop is modifying the data inside of the array as opposed to overriding the whole array with a different array. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to get to arrays. In a I second. still have one more thing with variables, though, if you're not. If... Yep, go for it. So, and are you going to like the let and stuff? Yep. I, all right, that'll wait. Okay. So, three different ways we can declare a variable. One is our constant. Um, with our example here, if we want to change num1 to a new number, number and then console log it out, we can't do that because it is a const. So the newer way of uh, declaring variables variables is either const or let. And what let is going to do is it's going to say, hey, that value may change. It's not a constant value. It may change over time. So now that when we come down here, we can change our num1, run the code, and see our five coming out. Now, the old school way of declaring a variable was using var. And so what var is, is it's pretty much the equivalent of let, but it's, it's, an older, um, it's an older syntax. It's the way that JavaScript did it for the first, I don't know, two decades uh, JavaScript was around. So if you are reading some old code, you may see var in it. However, use of var is highly discouraged um, in favor of let and const. Okay. Okay. Okay, now I'm ready for your question, Larry. Um, so what's the difference between the var and let other than one being legacy and one not? Var is not only legacy, it has some scope. Um, it has some scope. Um, some complexity in scope. So basically when we have, um, earmuffs on for whoever does not want to get confused here. If you do not get that, that this is completely okay. But the only way I'm gonna be able to explain this is by, by coding it out. So um, if we have a function here and we say, um, oh, I don't know if this is actually going to work. Um, and I think I know a, a little bit, I just didn't like fully understand it because I did read some of it in um, eloquent JavaScript. So I know that there's an issue with the scope, but I just don't, I didn't like fully, fully understand it. Um, so we can skip it in interest of time, which may be. But the main thing is we shouldn't, we shouldn't use, um, use it. Correct. Yeah, okay. you should always be using let. Um, Do a for loop. I think the, the one they did was a for loop and that kind of showed it, but. No, we can we can skip it. We just use let and const. All right. This is the this is the Stack Overflow answer. So basically, define foo, define bar, and when we have foo and bar, of course, foo and bar is going to come out. Now, when we do moo and baz, we have access to it because it's in that scope. It's in that uh, block of code. But then when we come out and we do moo, we still have access to moo because it isn't actually scoped in this block of code. 
but when we do let, it is scoped into that code. So let it, this baz is no longer accessible because it's scoped into these brackets. So var falls, var overflows into the scope that surrounds it? Correct. Var okay. is always going to use the, it's going to go up to whatever the function level is, but let is only ever going to be scoped into whatever block of code it's in. Oh, okay. Thank you. With that said, I learned today that you can have a block of code that is not defined. Like this, I've never ever seen JavaScript code that's just curly braces without something before the curly brace. So that that to me like feels dirty. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that. And and that all that does is serve to put those variables in a different scope. Correct but not in a different function scope in a different block scope, which again, today I learned that function scope and block scope are two different things. Um, I'm gonna, I will share this in live stream in case you guys are interested in difference of let and var, but the TLDR, the, the summary on all of this is you should never be using var, always be using let and const because those are the newer versions of the way to declare a variable. Okay. And if you would like your brain to hurt, I shared the Stack Overflow question, which has 7,000 upvotes, now has 7,650. Oh, no, I'm not signed into Stack Overflow. Never mind, I can't upvote it. Um, if you're interested in how JavaScript works under the hood, that would be a good art. The Stack Overflow answer would be a good one to read. Okay. Um, next section, uh, we just covered variables. The upcoming section is objects and functions, but because we're only three minutes away from break, I think now's probably a good time to stop and come back at 7.20. With that said, I will stick around for the next three minutes in case anyone has questions on what we've covered so far. Hopefully, I have not bored you out of your out of your minds. Coming up, we've got more advanced JavaScript concepts. We're probably two thirds of the way through everything, um, and then we are going to spend some time on all the stuff you learned with Ryan last week and overviewing all of that. So, see you at seven twenty. So now that I'm in that far, I've basically got my dog and my cat. I've got access to the array and we can see that array here. So if we wanted to print out just cat, now this whole thing is the equivalent of this array up here. So we can come in here and access just the cat. And now we have the word cat coming out. Larry, question. Yes, if our um, key in the object is uh, not one word, we need to use quotes around it, right? I'm um, sorry, ask that again. If the key for one of our um, things in our object is not one word, we would have to use quotes around it, right? Correct. So, like, so right. if we wanted this to be my animals, we would have to put quotes around it. And then down here, instead of using animals, we would also have to use uh, bracket syntax here so that we could use the quotes to get my animals out. Thank you. So dot dot uh, uh, notation is always the preferred notation, even though this works completely fine. When you can use dot notation, it is preferred that you do. And oftentimes you will find that developers will not use my animals as a key like this. If they have control over the key, they will instead use camel casing. And then that will allow us to say dot my animals down here. But yes, if your key, your key is allowed to have spaces in it, if it does, you have to put it in quotes. Um, and then uh, you cannot use the um, dot syntax, which is the preferred syntax. You do have to use uh, square brackets in quotes. Did I see, Nicole, did you have a question temporarily? 
I was just, uh, I answered my own question, but I was trying to figure out why I did it with one and the cat, but I realized the dog was zero, and then the cat was zero was the first one. Was, yep. You got it. Yeah. So one here is not referring to the first item in the list. It's referring to the first index. The index of cat is one. The index of dog is zero. Okay, that covers objects in the self-assessment. If you want to score yourself there. We are moving on to functions. Now we've got functions broken up into uh, two sections here. One is the general idea of functions and the other one is parameters and arguments. So the point of function is being able to group your code so it is reusable down the road. So if we come down here, um, two ways of declaring our function. Uh, the one that I've been primarily using is an arrow function. So we can uh, say, we're gonna name our function. Then we are going to say, okay, what's it equal to? Just like we set uh, variables equal to numbers or to strings, we can also set variables equal to a function. So we're gonna say open and close parentheses. What we're doing there is we're saying this takes no parameters or arguments yet. Now that equal arrow is telling it, hey, we're storing a function in this variable. Now, what would you like this function to do? That's what's going to happen between the curly braces. So we're going to say it's going to console log out hello, and it's going to console log out um, I'm adding things together. And then it's going to console log out two plus two. And then it's going to log out good day, goodbye. Now I come down here and I run my code again. And all I get out is cat. None of this code runs because we did not call or execute the function. So if I in order to make this function actually run here, I need to tell my, my code, hey, go run my func. But by just telling it the variable name, that's like saying var2. It's like, well, what do you want me to do with var2? So the way we get my func to actually run is we put these empty parentheses after it. Now that these parentheses are here, it's going to say, oh, my func. I need to go run all of the code between these curly braces. So now that I come down here and I run my node script.js, now I get, uh, hello, I'm adding things together for good day, goodbye, right? It's running all of the code inside of this function. Now, this is the newer way of declaring a function. The other way of declaring a function, which you will probably see in free code camp, is this way. And this is going to do all the same things between the curly braces. And if I call my func2, now you'll see that outputs all of the same stuff. This arrow syntax is the newer, more preferred way of doing it. However, there is going to be a whole heck of a lot of old JavaScript code that you see that will be doing it that way. And there's really nothing wrong with that. No, uh, I think that's why I'm confused. <laughs> Okay. So, yep. These are the exact, they're almost identical to each other. There are some benefits to arrow functions, but that goes back to the earmuffs comment we made before because all of the scoping benefits of let and uh, const are also built into arrow functions. Um, basically, arrow functions bind this into it. So the arrow function knows what context it's running in not a concept that you need to wrap your head around. The only concept you have to understand is this code and this code are doing almost I, the I, exact same thing. The only difference here is that we're taking the function and storing it into the variable as opposed to declaring that variable in global scope. If you don't understand that, that's fine. Just know that this is the preferred syntax. Any questions on uh, functions before we move on to parameters and arguments. 
So the whole point of this function is that we can we can call this code multiple times, right? So if we want to, we can call my func, then we can have it do my func two, then we can have it do my func again. And what it's going to do is it's going to execute all this code, then it's going to execute all of this code, and then it's going to execute all of this code again without us having to keep on repeating that over and over again. So if I run my code, we're going to see that we get a lot of output here for this running uh, multiple times. OK, so now we can talk about parameters and arguments. So sometimes um, a function needs additional input in order to know how to run. So let's say we're going to uh, rename my func to add uh, two numbers together um, and print out additional text. Yes, I have named functions longer than that before. But we can take that, copy and paste it into where we called those functions. And what we need to do is we need to tell this, this function, hey, there's going to be some incoming parameters. We're going to give you these parameters of how, your, how this function is supposed to run. And that's going to take num1 uh, and num2. And num1 and num2 are going to be added together. Now, when I run this, I'm going to get not a number. Well, because I told it, hey, these are incoming parameters. Here are some data that we're sending into the function. But we did not add the arguments when we called the function in order to be sent into the parameters up here. So what we need to do is we need to add arguments now to where we call or execute the function. So if we say five and seven, now it's going to know, hey, five, that's going to be in our num one. And seven, because there's a comma separating it, is going to go into our num two. So now when we run this code, we get 12 coming out. And we could comment this back in and give it two different numbers, run the code, and get seven coming out. Now let's say there's a bug in this, this function. Let's say that I call this function 15 different places all over my code, and I realize that it wasn't really supposed to be adding the two numbers together. It was supposed to be adding the two numbers together and subtracting five for some reason. Now we can modify that code in one place and both places that we call that function are going to do the right thing and subtract five. Even though we changed it in the one spot, because we're reusing this function over and over again, we're able to fix that bug in one place and have it, and have it reflect everywhere. So the whole point of a parameter is saying, hey, when we set up the function, the parameter is data that is going to be sent into this function that's going to give us the parameters of how this function is supposed to run. And the way that we provide those parameters into the function is by defining the arguments down here between the parentheses. Now, we can use uh, parameters uh, just the same way in a, the, the more old school way of declining, uh, defining a function. Let's uh, get crazy here and call this um, adder one and adder two. We can really call it whatever we want. And then down here, we say adder one and adder two. And now when we call our my func two, we are just going to give it two numbers. Let's give it num one and num two. Save it. I run it. I get five. Well, wait, where's five coming from? Five, my func two, my func two. Okay, we know things are going into adder one and adder two, but where's num one and num two? Oh, that's coming all the way up from up here. So now when this code runs, it goes, oh, I know what num one is. Num one is equal to two. And I know what num two is, that's equal to three. So we're going to take those numbers and send it in to adder one, which is now going to be two, and adder two, which is now equal to the number three. So when we add two and three together, we get five. 
So parameters, I'm sorry, arguments don't have to necessarily be just numbers or strings. They can also be variables that we're sending in. Okay, that takes care of parameters and arguments on the self-assessment form. Any questions there before we move on? Don't kill me, but can you scroll up a little bit? Yep. Um, so when you alter oh, the my function part. I'm sorry, I'm just So the fun how come you didn't do like a function equal? I did up here. Oh, can I see it? Right here. Yeah, but I'm saying like. Sorry, what's what's your question? It's going to be extremely long. So what I'm trying to ask is. It, I'll just ask another time. It's too well. Okay. Sean Jay, you're up next. So I was just thinking about that last part you just said. You said, and then I kind of was, was looking at um, when you scrolled up here, because you said here you have add numbers to get together and print out additional text. How do you, and I think I asked this before in class, like how do you know what to put, like how does it know that when you, like, how do you know to put that together there? Or is it, it was that just by example to show? Because the last thing you stated was um, you don't have to just use numbers and uh, the strings, you can also use variables. So yes. did you mean the numbers? So here, num1 and num2, those are not actually numbers. Those are variables that are coming from up here. And those variables have numbers in them. Okay, so how does it uh, know that when, like, what is this const add two numbers together and print out additional text? Is that you just providing a, a function to those variables? That is another variable. This very long name is another variable that is storing oh. a function, but we didn't call it because we commented those two out. So, so you said if, if we comment these two back in, we can do the same thing. We can send in num1 and num2. And then when we run this code, um, it's going to do, it's going to run this function first because we called that one first. And it's going to say, I'm adding two things together. And then it's going to run my func two. So it's going to run all the code in here. Okay, my, my thing is that long text you created that or that's within uh no i created that you can name a function almost anything that you want and it'll compute it yeah so so i could call this my crazy function if i wanted to but i need to define that down here it needs to know when i'm executing the function the first part that comes before the param the parentheses is what it's going to go execute which, okay, 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 I got you, I got you. I, I was just trying to fix it. Like, I'm like, wait a minute, but I, I understand now. Christy, um, did you have a question? Yeah, so when in pre code camp, when we were doing things like this, they used var a lot. Yep. More so than const. So, uh, doing those exercises and then using var and then coming back over here and only using const and let um, kind of is confusing. I understand that we know we have to know uh, var for previous um, things. So is there a resource? Um, I know that we have the eloquent book, but is there another resource where we could use we can do some of this and practice this so that we can become more familiar with it without um, the VAR because we really don't. <clears throat> so the only, the only practice that you need there is anytime you see VAR, use let instead. 
Right. Period. So when we're doing the pre cold camp exercises, we can we cannot use bar when they tell us to use bar and use let instead or use const instead. You should be able to, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, see, that wasn't. I guess that wasn't defined. So we were using something. I was following the directions that they gave. Um, but again, outside. So when we go into, I just I would just like another some more resources because i i understand this when you're doing it but um away from this sometimes it's not as understandable i guess i'm trying to say so for more practice um linkedin learning uh if you have an onondaga county library card you get free access to linkedin learning which used to be called lynda.com um, mm -hmm. There are some intro to JavaScript courses there. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I don't know is um, we use Khan Academy later on for SQL. I don't know if they have. Um, yeah, Khan Academy has a good one. I'm going to share this in the live stream. Um, that may be a good one to go through. Um, and that's going to cover all, you, you'll notice the list over on the left is almost identical to the self-assessment form that we're filling out right now in terms of text and strings, functions, um, if statements. Oh, I may have forgotten that on the self-assessment. I most certainly did. Um, let me add that in before I forget for the next time we do this. Uh, variables, objects, functions. Let me add it here. Um, if statements. Okay, I will cover that in a second. But um, the Khan, Khan Academy is one that I can recommend. But I cannot promise you that they have all updated to let and const, right? And that's just a part of being a developer is knowing that these things change and and the gods that control JavaScript and the different uh, ECMAScript uh, versions that come out may make decisions down the road that update the language, right? Um, there were uh, Python uh, 2 uh, had so many changes that they wanted to make to it that they said, when Python 3 comes out, we don't promise you any of your Python 2 code is going to run in Python 3. We fixed so many things at a low level that when you start writing Python 3 code, you've got to convert all of your Python 2 code over to Python 3. We won't promise you that your code will just magically run. Uh, JavaScript has more backwards compatibility. Um, so chances are that like you, you can continue using var and your var code is not going to break. And even if you're 20 years from now, chances are your var code is not going to break. But there are benefits to using let and const under the hood that are that make the computer easier to keep track of your variables. And that's why we're encouraging it, right? So there are some new uh, JavaScript features that just came out that we aren't teaching yet in our curriculum because I'm still learning how to use them, right? Um, but programming languages are constantly going to evolve and there are constantly new languages coming out, right? Um, it's kind of crazy to think about, but 10 years ago, React didn't even exist, and now it's powering some crazy percentage of, of um, websites. So things are going to constantly change, and there is a downside to, to using slightly outdated learning resources. Um, but I think it's important to balance in like, okay, they're using var. Whenever I see var, just picture them using let instead, and everything is going to connect to what we've taught so far. And, and the same, same for the functions, right? Of it, it is important to know that, yes, while I am using the newer version like this in class, you're going to get out into the workforce. And somewhere at some point, you're going to see a function defined like this. And it's important to know that, hey, the parameters come here in the arrow function, but those same parameters uh, come here when you're using the, the, key, the function keyword. And yeah, uh, Nicole made a good point of uh, the prep work for the, the class. I think it was Udemy. Um, Udemy also has a good intro to JavaScript that you can uh, go through. 
Okay. That answer your question, Christy? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Just go back to self-assessment. Um, okay, so if statements. If statements are logical forks, right? They're saying, hey, go check to see if this condition is true. If this condition is true, go do this stuff. If this condition is not true, go do something else. So what we do is we say, hey, if num1 is less than five, then console.log under five. So we run this code. I'm going to just comment this stuff out. And we see under five pops up. Well, why did not under five pop up? Well, if we go up to num1, we set num1 equal to two. Okay, so now we come down here. Two is less than five. So go run this code in here. If it's not under five, else go console log out above five. Okay, so now when we come up here and we change this to six, now we get above five. Now we can do anything in here. We could say, hey, if it's above five, then go do our function that's adding two numbers together and printing out some additional text. And if we wanted to, we could do multiple lines of code. So now when we run, it's going to print all of that stuff out, and then it's still going to say still under five. Because we're checking the logic here, and the logic is saying, hey, it's not under five. So whatever's in this if statement is not going to run. If this is not true, then go down to the else and run anything between this curly brace and this curly brace. In other words, go run anything in the else block of code. Now, if we want to check uh, if num1 is equal to something, we can't use a single equal because what's happening here is the computer is saying num1 is equal to five. You want me to take five and put it into num1? Whenever we use a single equal, it's considered an assignment operator, right? It's trying to assign five into num1. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to compare num1 to see if it is equal to five. So we're going to use a triple equal here, which is not only comparing whatever num1 is to the number five, it's also checking to make sure that the type of five, which happens to be number, a number is equal to the type of num1, which is also a number. So oftentimes there are very few cases that you want to use a double equals. You almost always want to use a triple equals because what you're checking is making sure that five is the same type as num1 and that the num1 value, which is up here, which is six, is compared to the type and number of five. So when we run that code, we still get still under five because it's hitting the else statement. If we come back up here and check to see if it is if it is equal to five, now we can check and see that we're getting under five because five is equal to five. We also have else if statements where we can check for additional uh, code. And it's worth noting that as soon as it hits an if statement, it's never going to execute this or the else code because it found one that is true. Questions on if statements? Can you say the, that again? Yeah. So <laughs> if, if we have like else if num1 is um, less than or equal to five, console.log, this is true. So what's going to happen is num1, we already said, is uh, is equal to five, right? So this if statement is true. This if statement is also true. But this will never log out because as soon as we find the first true if statement, it's going to stop checking any of the other if statements and only run this code. So node script, I'm going to get under five, even though num1 is less than or equal to five, this didn't print out 
because I hit this if statement. So else never ran. Now, if I wanted to get that to run, I could move that into its own if statement, at which point both of them are going to run under five is true. So if we tag, if we chain these together with the else ifs, as soon as it hits the first if that is true, it is going to stop checking the rest of the else ifs and the else and only execute this code. Okay, um, the only reason why you would do that, for example, is like kind of like in tic-tac-toe where there was different variation, different variables or um, situations where it could be different outcomes and yep. then you'll do the else if and the else. Yep, so basically if we're just checking to see if something is equal to five, we may not care if the number is is less than five if the number is five in this situation. But yeah, in, in tic-tac-toe, there are times that we want to say like, check for this condition first, right? Check to see if the, the player has run. Because if the player has won, we're gonna, we don't need to make a random turn. We don't need to do any of that stuff. The player won, say the player won and clear the board. But if the player has not won, go make the computer move. Now go see if the computer won. If the computer has won, now we're done. We don't need to let the player move again. But if the computer has not won, now we need to tell the player it's your turn to go. So that's when we would use our if statements and our else ifs and chain them together. Any other questions? Okay, uh, we are moving on to comments. So hopefully comments is a quick one. We've already started to use our comments here. Anything with a double slash in it is a single line comment in JavaScript. There are other kinds of comments. If we use a slash and a star, that is what's considered a multi-line comment. Uh, so we can add a couple notes here. And then to terminate this multi-line comment, we're going to do a slash and another star. And now anything that I add down here will run. So add down here is coming out. It's ignoring anything in here because we're using a multi-line comment. So uh, slash star multi-line, uh, single slash is just a single line comment. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't need to terminate if I just console log something down here. I don't need to terminate that comment. Just really quick. Um, I was trying to do a double line on HTML, but that's the only that's you only have to do one. Right? Um, HTML will support a multi-line comment if you do uh, exclamation mark dash dash and then close oh, yeah, the okay. comment dash dash exclamate uh, uh, closing arrow. That will that will be a multi-line comment for you in HTML. Okay, thank you. So I had him confused. No problem. You can still do the double slash to get rid of a single line, right? In JavaScript, not in HTML. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had problems with that recently, and I couldn't remember how to comment stuff out. Thank every, you. Every language has its own, um, has its own comments. Um, in CSS, you can't do a double slash, but you can do a slash star, and that will comment things out. So every language supports a, a different comment syntax. Dumb, but. Um, okay. So uh, moving on to arrays. We've already played around with arrays a little bit. Uh, we had our uh, animals array. There was a whole host of functions that are built into arrays. Um, if you do a search for JavaScript array and pop open W3Schools, you'll see uh, not only how to create an array, but um, uh, 
Oh, come on. Give me the array functions. Is it under array method? Thank you. Okay, so methods built into arrays. Um, we can convert an array into a string. Uh, we can also uh, do things like join all of the uh, array uh, things together. So if we wanted to uh, say, hey, I want all of these to print out, I could say console.log, take my animals and join them all together using a comma and a space between them. And when I run that code, you'll see that I get my cat and then it added a comma and a space, my dog, a comma and a space. Um, and it goes on and on for each uh, for each item in the in the array. Other array methods you can use are dot push. Um, so if you say animals.push, that will add on something to the end. Um, so when we console log out our, our array, we get elephant added to the end. Uh, should be pretty pretty common. Um, different methods for editing and uh, working with your array there. Of course, you can always access uh, a single element in the array by using the index, and you would get out uh, five. Any questions on when we would use an array, basic methods with an array, anything like that? When is an optimal time that you would say, hey, let me throw an array in here? Whenever you would like to store multiple values that are associated together. So, hey, I need to store my animals and I can have more than one animal. So I want to store all of them together, right? Whenever you have data, that's just a list of, of all the data. Let's say you have um, a list of scores, right? And, and you want to keep track of every uh, grade a student has gotten. Well, you would store that in a list. However, if you have data that's associated with a key value pair and you go, hey, I want to store not only the make, but also the model and the gas mileage and the price of this car. Well, now that's going to be an object because I'm, I need to store not only all of those keys of, of what the data is about, but also the values for all of them of uh, Toyota Corolla and all of that kind of stuff. Thank you. And there are often times that you will see objects in arrays of, hey, not only do I want to store the make and the model and the gas mileage, but I have several cars that I want to store all of that data of. So at that point, you would put an object right inside of your array. And once you create your array and they have all the things like, um, and I might be saying this incorrectly, uh, like the push or the 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 slice or whatever, whatever the words, I don't have them right here in front of me. Yep. Why, no, you're good. when would you want to, why would you change the, why wouldn't you just change the array? Why would you like, so why, you, why wouldn't you just rewrite or recall the array instead of utilizing those other things? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So let's say that you um, are asking the user, what's your, what's your, at, tell me what your animal is that you would like to add. And they type in, in, you know, elephant. Well, now we don't want to take this whole array, redefine it and put elephant in it. All we want to do is add elephant to the end of it. That makes sense. Um, the other, the one in tic-tac-toe, uh, we wanted to modify just that single spot that we were in and put an X in it. So we had to take the row index and the column index and put an X in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, for loop, two different kinds of for loops. First for loop is let i equal zero. That is called your initializer. That is where the loop is going to start. Then you have your conditional. Hey, when is this loop going to continue to run while well, i is less than five? Then you have your incrementer. OK, every time this loop runs, what would you like to do to i? I want to add 1 to it. Now, if we console log out i, we're going to see that this loop runs uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times and is done running. Now, if we wanted to say, hey, I want this loop to run, but every time it runs, I want you to add 2 to i, you can say i plus 2. 
Oop, you can say i equals i plus two. And when you run that, it's going to say, all right, first time this loop runs, i is zero. OK, now that I've console logged out i, I hit this curly brace, I come back up, i is now going to have two added to it. So now is two less than five? It is, so go ahead and console log out i. Now we see two. OK, now we come down here. It's done running this loop. It comes back up, says add one to i. Uh, i is now six. Six is not less than five, so it stops running that code. This five that's printing out is coming from my console logs here. So if I just console log, if I comment those out and uh, rerun this, now we get zero, two, and four. The other way to use a for loop is to say, hey, go through every item in the array. And every time you get an item of the animals, Go ahead and console log out that item. So quick way to run through an array. If we need to get each item out of the array, we can do a for const of loop. And when we run that, we see cat and dog and five. So every time this loop runs, it's taking the first item from the array and storing it in item. Now we can do whatever we want to it. If we wanted to add something to the end of it, we could say is an animal. And now we would loop over it and cat is an animal and dog is an animal. Basic for loop. Any questions there? So just to make sure I understand. Um, no, I is it, right here. No, that I understand. So, <laughs> oh, got it. Right. Got it. Got it. <laughs> All right. So let I equal zero. Okay. That equals zero. So how did you get, I know, right, Zach? <laughs> Um, so how did, um, I'm not sure how you, like, I, I see everything, but I'm not understanding how okay. you got. First time, yeah. three, three parts to this for loop, where the, the incrementer is going to start. We're going to start this one at zero. The condition, which is what is checking to see if this code should run another time. And then finally, the incrementer, which runs whenever this code is, whenever this loop has uh, completed an iteration. So what we do is we say, hey, I is starting out at zero. Is zero less than five? Yes, it is. Forget about everything else on this line. Go ahead and console log out this code. And go ahead and run whatever other lines of code there is until we hit this curly brace down here. OK, now we're done doing everything for this iteration of the loop. So we come back up here to this section of the loop. OK, what was i? i, we started out at 0. 0 is going to have 2 added to it, and that is going to be the new i. So now we come back in to the conditional. Is 2 less than 5? Yes, it is. So go ahead and console log out i again. Well, we know i is 2. OK, we hit the end of the loop. Now we come back up here. i is now 2. 2 plus 2, now i is 4. Is 4 less than 5? Oh, it is, so we have to go run the loop again. Go ahead and console log out whatever i is. That's our 4. Now we hit the end of the loop. We come back up here. i was 4. We added 2 to it. Now i is going to be 6. Is 6? less than five. No, it's not. So we're done running this loop and we're going to move on to our next section of code. OK, perfectly said. Thank you. On that one, I think what was, I don't know if this is part of what Nicole was asking, but I think what was confusing for me initially when I was doing the exercise of this, in the back of your mind, you have to remember that this is, you know, uh, is is zero one two three? You know how it starts and and it keeps um, not necessarily the numbers, but when they're counting things in uh, JavaScript, that there's the zero, the zero space, the one space, the two space, the three space, the four space. Those are all like they're in the background, and that's what is bumping up against. So I think 
when you're not seeing that piece of it, but then this, you're getting this result. You know, like I think the invisible part is where it kind of got, and initially where it was confusing for me. And then I had to go back and rethink about how it, does, it was bumping up against zero, bumping up against one, those, but they, they just weren't visible for me to see them. Okay, so we've got our two for loops. We've got our uh, traditional for loop where we are using a, uh, we initialize the variable that we're incrementing. We have our conditional, and then we have uh, what it's going to increment by uh, each time at the end of the loop. And then we have a uh, kind of a shorthand for looping over every item in an array. So we're going up to animals and every time we get an animal like cat, we're gonna store it in item and then we can do whatever we want um, in the array. And then the next time this loop runs, it's gonna go get dog, it's gonna store dog in item and then it's gonna go run that code. Okay, Any questions quickly. there? Yep. Wait, yes, go back to the code really quick. Okay, so quickly- um, Sorry. You made me forget it. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Oh, oh. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I forgot. It's, it's gone. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. My Chrome crashed on me, and I was just like, "Well, where, where's the next thing I'm moving on to?" And and then it was a pain to pull back. Up. Oh, I'm, sorry. I remember. Go so ahead. you see how you have it as a four and a curly brace, and then like another four and a curly brace. Would it could this could this be made into like a else if or something like that or else for or let for I don't know like should it be together? You could do an if no. statement in your for loop. Okay. Okay. You could that, say, oh, that's fair. you could say if i is equal to zero, console log. First time the loop has run. Else. Console log i equals so now uh, first time the loop is run and then it goes back through it adds uh, two to i i is now two now when it says i is not equal to zero so then go ahead and console log this out instead. So we get first time the loop is run, i equals two, and then i equals four, and then the loop is done running. Okay, thank you. Sean J. I guess my question is for the, um, and I was just looking in uh, W3 schools, but for that, so I guess with the semicolons, it's always, the loop is always gonna have those three, um, parts yeah yep okay. if you're if you're doing a traditional for loop or you could do something like use the of keyword and then at that point it would know oh you want to loop over every item for every item of the array and store that in here okay so there are different kinds of for loops um but if you're talking about the traditional for loop yes it's always going to have three parts and it can tell those parts apart by the semicolons inside of them. All right. Okay. Okay. We are going to move on. We are going to save. Hmm. Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to, I'm going to try and get through the rest of the JavaScript stuff. So um, while loop, just like a for loop, um, the only difference is that you have to uh, change a condition inside of it. So uh, you can say, um, let loop should keep running equal true. And while the loop should keep running, console log out, um, loop is running and then uh at some point we need to stop the loop from running so let's say let counter equal five 
uh, keep adding to the counter every time this loop runs. And if the counter is less than 10, uh, loop should keep running is now going to be false. OK, so while the loop should keep running, well, that's true. OK, so what's the first time we're going to print out the loop is running? We're going to add one to the counter. Counter is now 6. Is 6 uh, greater than 10? No, it's not. So this if statement doesn't run. We come back up to the while loop. While loop should keep running is still true. So we go back through. We print out console uh, loop is running. We get down to the counter. Uh, counter is now 7. 7 is not less than 10. Uh, we tend to use while loops when we don't know how many times the loop is going to run. Um, otherwise, we tend to use for loops. Um, so while loops, uh, I would say 90% of my time, I am writing a for loop. 9% um, uh, of my time, I'm using a while loop. And 1% of the time, I'm using recursion. Um, so basic while loop, uh, something that we have to teach because it's built into JavaScript, not something that gets a ton of use. Any questions about that? No, it's, it's, it's basically like everything else. <laughs> yes. OK. I don't want to think too deep about it. OK. Document object model. Now we have to get outside of uh, just what we're executing in Node. And the reason we have to do that is the document object model, how we interact basically our HTML and our JavaScript together, we can't do that in Node. We need a browser. So um, what we do is I have, oh, let's stop it and restart it. Here was all of our code that we were working with. So we have somewhere in here, we've got a div ID left. So what we can do in our JavaScript is we can come down here and we can say const left div, and we're going to store something in that. We're going to say, go to the document and get the element by the ID of left, and then console log out the left, uh, the left div. So when we look in our browser, we come over here, we inspect, we go to the console, we see our div ID left. OK, that's great. But because we've got the ID, we've got that div, we can uh, apply things to it. We can say, hey, go to the left div and make the inner HTML equal to um, test. Now when we come over here, we now have access to test. But we can also hook on things like, and I'm chaining here. So DOM inner HTML, this is just saying, hey, we can go to the document and get elements from it. And based off of those elements, we can change our, in our JavaScript, what shows up in our HTML. Prime example of when we did this was we said, hey, we want to go, when an X shows up in the board, uh, go ahead and, and make that X show up in the browser. The other thing we can do is we can work in reverse. We can say, hey, get the left div. And when something happens, when an on click happens, I want you to run a function and console log out hello. If I come back over here and I click on the word test, I get hello printing out in my console. So we can uh, attach events. Uh, when a, uh, when something happens using the on keyword. Um, and we can have all different kinds of events like on page scroll or uh, on click or on uh, context menu, which is on a right click, uh, different, different events going on there. And uh, events can work both ways. You can also tag it in your HTML. Um, so if you wanted your button, uh, let's say if you click on the right section, I want you to do my right section clicked function. So if we take that and we go back into our script.js and we define that function, we can make it do something like alert right section 
was clicked. So events can work both ways. We can get out our um, our element from our HTML using document dot get element by ID, or we can work in reverse and say, hey, index, when you are clicked on, go run this function called write section clicked function. And then we need to define that in our, in our JavaScript. So when I come over here and refresh, and now when I click on write section, it does nothing and makes me a little liar. So that would be considered backwards doing it that way? Um, not necessarily backwards, but it's just you can you can approach it either way. Oh. Uh, I forgot the the parentheses here. Uh, so now it works. So we can we can tell our HTML to go run some JavaScript, or we can tell our JavaScript to run when an event happens. It's fine to link it either way. Any questions about JavaScript events? Are you going to get into more in depth of that right click? So like, you just like, <clears throat> I can understand what it's doing and doing it when it's printing out. Or maybe we ain't there yet, but. <laughs> um, so we can do on context menu is how you do a right click. So we can say in our JavaScript, So now if I single click on, if I left click on right click, right section, I get left click. And if I right click on it, I get right click. Okay. Because we can have multiple events, right? Hey, on click is when something gets left clicked. But on context menu is when something gets right clicked. Christy, question. Yes. Um, I think I just kind of got what you said. I don't think I got it before. But my, my question was yesterday when I was working on the Tic Tac Toe and I was trying to do some like CSS and bootstrap. So when you bring over, remember when we were in HTML and we brought over uh the css uh i think it was link href isn't there another one that you bring over for javascript too if you wanted to style can you style the javascript or is your javascript is is generating some html mm -hmm. and that html would have to have classes or style tags on them to be applied but you don't bring over another link? No. I thought I saw that yesterday. Okay. Max, I think she's asking about the script tag that you put at the bottom of the body. Oh, in order to get our, our script.js to run, we do need to add in this script source equals script.js. That wasn't that wasn't what I saw, but okay. It, it was a it was a JavaScript. It was it was relating to CSS and JavaScript. Yeah. So if we if we come in here and we said, hey, the left div is now going to equal test, we could make this a new div with an ID of um, custom styling and say, uh, you know, my uh, JS content here and close out that div. Now, when we're over here, we get my JS content here. But if we wanted to, we can use this custom styling in our style.css and say that this is going to be um, text decoration underline. So now my JS content here is underlined because we, when we created the div, we added an ID to it. Okay. I kind and, of have a question too. And then, so when we, so every, so when we use left div, then that's dot the inner HTML we're referring back to. I, I think when when we were doing this in um, tic tac toe, I, I don't think I 
understood it. I understand. I think I understand better now what you're saying. Okay. So initially when this page first loads, before any JavaScript runs, it's got this as the left div. Mm -hmm. Now it gets down to the bottom of the page and goes script.js. I have to go do whatever's in script.js. So it comes back here and it says, oh, go get the left div for me from the HTML document. Now take whatever is inside the left div, chuck it out the window and put in this div instead. Oh, right. So we're re redirecting the inner HTML to do what we wanted to do via JavaScript. So now we have the words my JS content here. But the browser isn't done. Once it puts in this div, it goes, whoa, hold up. This div has an ID on it. That ID has custom styling. Let me go to my style sheet. Hey, look, there's a selector that uses custom styling. That means we need to make that text show up as underlined. OK. And I think I asked before about the get element ID, but yeah, I, it just clicked. So yeah. OK. I, I understand. Is that called left div because you put it in? Uh... I just gave it an ID of left. Right, right, right. right. OK. OK, so before I'm sorry, Nicole, if you named that something else, just for example, how would you, it would be the same thing? If I, I, I mean, did something else here or in the JavaScript? In your, uh, in your HTML, if you just named that, like whatever, um, like, oh, because that was already reprinted from the code that you had when you created that. Um, well, if I know. use a different ID here, mm. I need to make sure my JavaScript knows that I'm looking for my crazy div. Okay. I got it, but that was already re. Um, that left was you didn't create the ID. That was printed out from your code that you copied from. No, I I just call I just made it an ID called left. Oh. Because when I expand this out, this is on the left side and this yeah. is on the right side. Okay, okay, because I'm like, all right, got you. <laughs> no, the the IDs I came up with myself, the the call SM12 and the row and the container. Those are all coming from Bootstrap, but I could call this whatever I want as long as I'm consistent. So as long as I call this my left section, then when I come into my JavaScript, I just need to make sure that I'm using that ID when I'm pulling it out. And I can call it whatever I want once, the, once it comes into my JavaScript. I can keep calling that left div if I want to. So now it just shows up here. Uh, Nicole, question. Um, it was just a random one. So you see how you have the right section click function? Would I be able to, but you just basically explained it. So now I kind of understand that if I wanted to use that word or for that section, would I have to be an ID or a flag within the HTML? Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Is is on click? That's kind of like a, a a generic or like a general generic function that always works. So if you if you attach on click to something, it always has the same um, meaning. Yes. Okay. And all of those are defined. If you go to W three schools JS events, there is a very long list. Um, of uh, one example is an on click, uh, but there are other common ones like on change, which is going to be whenever you type a letter into an input, um, or on mouse over is going to mean that you just put your mouse over whatever element. You didn't have to click on it, but if your mouse was over that element at any point, it's going to run your JavaScript. Um, on key down is when you're like, if you type a letter and you want to jump it to a certain section of the page, you can do on key down. Um, so there, there are lots of different events. Um, I'm surprised W3 doesn't have them all listed, but um, these are definitely the most common ones. Larry, there's, question. Um, there's a lot of list right under there, though. But um, so adding an event listener, would that happen in the JavaScript part or in the HTML part? 
you are technically adding an event listener when you use an on anything attribute, but you can explicitly use the word add event listener in your JavaScript. So um, this is a, a shorthand that I use for on click, but you could say um, left div dot add event listener, and then you have to tell it what event you're you're listening for. Um, so this would be uh, on mouse over, and then it is going to run a function that says console dot log. You moused over me. And how are you able to just? Um bypass doing that in the uh, JavaScript with the dot notation? Um, at some point in JavaScript, they decided that this would be an acceptable shorthand and just mapped this to do the same thing as this. OK, thank you. I'm pretty sure you can do left div dot on mouse. Yeah. One may be more considered more proper than the other, um, but they achieve the same the same goal. I'm I'm not I'm not sure which one is cleaner. Thank you. So <laughs> this is crazy. So add event listener means that we're adding an event from the JavaScript. I mean, from the common HTML events list. Yes. What is listener? What a wide listener? What is that? Because it's listening for the event to happen. And when it hears that event happening, it executes your code. Wow. Okay. I, I, the listener totally threw me, was throwing me off. Okay. I got it now. It's um, almost like you're listening to my teachings. Ooh. Okay. I'm tired. <laughs> I just have one question, like, um, cause it's, it's still in the back of my head with that. Uh, and I just want to know, cause maybe it'll help me, uh, light bulb and tie everything together. Yep. If you wanted to, um, for example, you, when you first started, you did that, uh, you, the right click on, um, on the HTML on the, on the actual uh, browser, yep. um, and it has that pop up that comes up. Yep. Where it says, "Okay, you right clicked." Um, essentially, sometimes people will probably make like a menu or something there if they right click or anything. Like, how would you add? Would you? How can you just? How would you? Uh, yeah. How would you make it do something else rather than that pop up? there so you would have to like add a new div to the page or so after that, so when this was clicked you're going to create a div and then basically you'll put that menu there correct you, but you'll do it in ht you'll do it within here i would do it this i would say like here like this is going to be the the easiest example so like let me say div and i'll say like um Option number one, option number two, and this is going to have a style of display none and an ID of my menu. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, when this thing was right clicked on, go document dot get element by ID of my um, my menu and set the style to display a uh, block. So now nothing shows up, right? But when I right click on this, you mm -hmm. see my option one and my option two appear. Okay. 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 So fuck load. We are going to finish things up. Um, you will notice section five is all about APIs. 
Um, because those questions are required, just answer them truthfully. Just let me know how you're feeling about those API topics. We will dive in here tomorrow of doing a quick run through of all the API stuff. And then I will take all of the responses from that form from tonight um, and figure anything else out from there of, of what else we need to cover. I do have a chat project that I would love to get to, um, but it's more important that we're getting these concepts down. So tomorrow we are going to go through the rest of the things on that form for the API section. Um, but again, for tonight, uh, please just fill out that form uh, based off of where you're at. Um, and then I will use all of that for tomorrow's class to figure out anything else we need to touch on, and then we can dive into the chat app. Hopefully tonight wasn't too, too slow. Um, I think, I'm, I'm hoping that one of the side effects of going through all of this stuff is to say, wow, we're at week 11 and look at all of these concepts I have learned. Right. And it's OK if, if you're if you're not at the point where you're like, I've mastered this, I'm on to the next thing. That's all right. But we are just shooting for that. This is pretty familiar. I mostly have it under under control. And that's that's where we're, we're shooting for. Um, so hopefully a good review for everyone. I see seven responses in already. That's great. I would love for everyone to get that in. Um, but. I will see you all tomorrow. We will review all of the stuff that you did last week with Ryan, um, and then we will go from there. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'll stick around in case anyone has last minute questions. Otherwise, I will jump out. Um, no, tonight was a really good class, I must say. I should have said, go fill out the feedback form. Okay, I'll do that as well. <laughs> All good.